Well, next, a brand new Batman. The long-awaited, much ballyhooed movie is about to open. Bob Brown with a preview and Batman of yesteryear. Batman's back right after this. On time, 23 years ago, and as will soon be seen in a theater near you. Years apart, worlds apart, Bob Brown looks at the reasons why. Batman's back when 2020 continues. Bat t-shirts, bat posters, bat sneakers, bat mania is here. But will Batman bring them to the bijou? Is America dying to see yet another comic book character brought to the silver screen? In recent years, cartoon characters have had a mixed record at the box office. Superman soared, Popeye got sand in his face. So will Batman go zonk or zowie? Well, we'll know soon after next week's premiere. In the meantime, Bob Brown has another Hollywood caper, making a film of the caped crusader. At the beginning, uh, I drew him as a vigilante, very mysterious, so dark and brooding. We've grown up with Batman. He's a cultural hero. Not evil, but he's got that dark side to him. Now you could write 10 volumes on a character like this and still not get what he's about. Fighting crime and rescuing the, the beautiful damsels in distress. He's still doing it for, you know, the betterment of man. So it's very simple when you put all the ingredients together. And just come up with a Batman. It's hard to imagine another comic book character who's been subjected to so many interpretations. And in Batman's 50th anniversary year, there's one more on the way. In this London recording studio a few weeks ago, musicians were adding the final notes to Batman, the movie. For a summer full of blockbusters, an expensive project with an unusual group of collaborators. So we got boom, boom, boom. let's add our splash. Danny Elfman, a star with an eight-man rock group called Oingo Boingo, composed a score for a 110-member symphony orchestra. Another rock artist, Prince, wrote songs for some of the scenes. I wouldn't want to do it just to do it. but if it And Tim Burton, scenes, only yeah, 29 years old when he was hired to direct the feature, came with a reputation for an offbeat way of seeing things, including the pressures of handling a shooting budget of more than $32 million. You're never prepared unless until you've done one of these things. It's like a, an out-of-body or death experience. I mean, who's, who's to say what it's like when you die? and you see the lights above the set and you see it becomes like a circus, a, a surreal circus, which I love. Burton is one of the hottest young directors in Hollywood, a former Walt Disney animator whose approach, like Batman's, is decidedly out of the mainstream. For example, one of Burton's earliest films was this live-action short called Frankenween, about a little boy who brings his dog back to life. You know, several mothers were dragging their children out of the theater. I don't know why, but, you know, I just... <laughs> I just don't know what this means. It means you don't have to go through house bringing another dog. You know you haven't petted him yet? It was a funny send-up of the Frankenstein stories, but the Disney Studios decided not to release it. For Batman, the stakes have changed. The funny thing about Batman is, is that I have this encyclopedia, and, you know, I tried to get a sense of the history of the character, and it just changed, you know, from decade to decade. It was not like... One of the first things organic. that Burton learned was that although Batman may be a comic book character, he's been analyzed and interpreted through several generations of fans. We'll look into that explosion as Batman and Robin take over. Over the years, there was the low-budget Batman from the 1940s Hollywood serials who had to change in the back seat of a Batmobile that looked like it came off the lot at below sticker price. But when the generation that cheered these Saturday serials grew up and had its own kids, they would find a new interpretation of their hero just down the road. 
In the 60s, Batman surfaced again as a campy kind of crusader. That offended those hardcore fans. Sometimes I think people expect too much of us, Batman. They have a right to expect it. But it created a craze. This was an era when, as everyone did their own thing, it looked like a darker tomorrow might never come for the caped crusader. But in his new incarnation for the 80s generation, Batman is a complex hero of graphic novels, reflecting an era when crime has grown to create new levels of fear and frustration, and everyone seems to bend the rules, and Batman has had about as much as he can take. That's the image this generation of fans has in mind when they describe their Batman. A dark hero. That's, I guess I call him dark hero in two words. Break the rules a little bit, but still get away with it. He's a big guy. You know, he's, he's in, in, in the comic, he's, he's six foot two ten, so he's a big guy. Attention, Game Boy shoppers. That's why there was a controversy when actor Michael Keaton, who had previously worked with Burton in the film Beetlejuice, was cast to play Batman. That is why I won't do two shows a night anymore, babe. I won't. I won't do. Well. But Burton had his reason. Now, I had seen lots of actors who would fit probably the more physical image of Batman, but I just always had trouble, when I imagined them, putting on a bat suit. And uh, Michael, you know, I just look at Michael, and I could, you know, enough said, really. You know, I could see him putting on a bat suit. Don't kill me. Don't kill me, man. I'm Batman. The film's producers were concerned enough about fan response to rush a trailer into movie theaters far ahead of schedule. It worked so well that the trailer drew applause in theaters not only for Keaton, who looked convincing as an 80s-style Dark Knight, but also for the casting of Jack Nicholson as Batman's demented foe, me, the Joker. Wait till they get a load of me. <laughs> In addition, an expert whose interpretations couldn't be disputed was hired as a consultant to the film. He is Batman's creator, Bob Kane. He doesn't have superpowers. So Batman could be you, and he could be uh, Tom, Dick, or Harry. And I think therein lies the, the secret to the crusader that w probably in most of us, we, we all feel like fighting back, but we don't either have the inclination or the, the opportunity or the desire to. So Batman fights our battles for us. Why does he fight them in such a bizarre costume? Kane says he was inspired to make his crusader dress like a bat after seeing drawings by Leonardo da Vinci and putting that idea together with a strange character in another Hollywood film titled The Bat Whispers. Third influence was uh, Zorro. And I got all the swashbuckling daring do from the marker Zorro. Had the dual identity, the board playboy during the daytime who fights against oppression at night as a crusader against all injustice. And he came out of a cave on a black horse tornado. Obviously, you see all the influences instead of the horse and the cave, I use the Batmobile. And to leave the grotesque gallery of villains, Kane turned to another weird influence, a 1928 film titled The Man Who Laughs. It's a story about a, a kid who had a face slashed into a ghastly smile by rival gypsies. So he grew up into a ghastly looking character with this white face, this ghastly red lips. And that's where I got the Joker from. When you see certain images, you know, like a little chemical is released in your brain. <laughs> One image that comes to mind is uh, the, the Joker character having a conversation with the corpse, which I quite like. Maybe we, uh, ought to give him a couple of days to think it over. No? It's funny, it's a bit scary, it's a bit... You know, it's a pleasant conversation, but it's with a blackened husk. I'm glad you did. 